Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Caden. Um, I am currently on break from study, but I'm studying to be um, a video game developer myself. Um, so this is something that really interests me. Um, Gwen works part-time at a tabletop game shop in Patoni. So, yeah. Um, so when we mean when we mean gaming, we're kind of talking the entire the entire gamut, really. Yeah. So we're looking at gaming as a whole, not just video games. The video games will feature quite prominently. Um, so should I take it away? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. So I can hazard a guess that a lot of people in this room enjoy the pastime of video games or tabletop games. Probably smaller few of you enjoy tabletop games. I count myself amongst that number. I enjoy them so much that I'm currently employed part-time and I teach tabletop war gamings and um, painting miniatures at bd &D Games in Petoni. Um, but gaming is, is a, gaming is a, such as a typical big shooter's Medal of Honor, Call of Duty, who makes those games and what other ties to other organizations do we have? Do we really know? Let's go on a bit of a deep dive to see which uh, main players in the AAA gaming industry and as well as a little bit of a warm-up imagery and associations with historical and fantasy wargaming. So let's get into my first slide. All right. So historical wargaming. Very, very recently... Um, very, very recently, on the 15th of May, 2023, popular YouTube channel Midwinter Minis, run by Guy Midwinter and his co-host Hattie, posted a YouTube video titled The Problem with Historical War Games. The video begins with the now controversial line, it's all fun and games until somebody has to play the Nazis, referring to historical war games such as Bolt Action and Flames of War. In the video, Guy and Hattie state the reasons for disliking particular historical war gamings war games whilst painting an M4 Sherman tank and a Panzer IV. During the video, whilst discussing which painter would paint which tank, Guy reveals Hattie's request to please don't make me paint the Nazis. And fairly, is that not the main problem with historical war games? Mainly one set during the Second, of Second World War. Firstly, some context. What is Bolt Action? Bolt Action is a 28mm tabletop war game set in the backdrop of World War II. It is designed for players to reenact battles and engagements from the period using miniatures and a rule system that emphasizes historical accuracy and tactical decision making. The game is produced by Warlord Games in 2000, in 2012. In bold action, players take on the role of commanders leading armies from various nations involved in the war, such as the United States, Germany, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, among others. They strategically deploy their forces, manage resources, and utilize a range of infantry, tanks, artillery, and other units to outmaneuver and defeat their opponent. Sounds fun, right? <clears throat> but what of Guy and Hattie, and what of the fascist in the gaming club? The one guy who decides to take things too seriously or is too accurate with their history. Historical wargaming is grounded. Exciting to relive well-known, it is exciting to relive well-known historical battles and cheaper than other tabletop war games such as Warhammer, which is in a fantasy space. It's easier to paint, not as colorful and out there, but we need to talk about the fascist problem. Why are historical war games less popular than fantasy ones? One of the main reasons is that these armies were real. People lived, fought, and died for their countries and theologies. Warhammer is a lot more fantastical without having a real bad guy and is set in space with futuristic machinery, which makes quite a departure from the reality in contrast uh, to historical war gamings, as nobody in the setting is the good guys, and really bad and horrific depictions of war crimes and atrocities are rampant. But it's all fictional. It is escapism. In historical war gaming, however, sometimes one has to play the Nazis, or at least one has to play the Nazis, or at least an army filled with pretty pretty oppressive and offensive ideologies. Um, it can seem like the glorification and admiration of a regime which murdered millions of Jewish people. This also happened in living memory of some people. And granted, a lot of these people are very old and kind of unlikely to play, be playing these games these days. It also affects the families of those people who might find it quite equally distasteful. The Nazis caused a lot of pain um, and trauma to the, vic to the victims of their crimes and to those who fought against them. The fact is that the game based in realism, portraying real violence actually happened, is going to turn a lot of people off. This is vastly different to a game with big stompy robots. 
um, and it just seems to be cool and fun. But let's not pretend the far right groups that far right groups don't exist and they don't play games or have an interest in tabletop gaming. Not to paint everyone with the same broad brush, but what reasons will we have for collecting an Axis army? Maybe they just maybe they're just power gamers. The Nazis had some pretty impressive military tech at the time. Maybe they just want to win the games they play with sheer force. Maybe some are more interested in trying to understand the rationale behind those atrocities and the psychological impact on the people who were part of these armies to some extent. Maybe they were just all big Hugo Boss aficionados. We don't know. Or maybe they might be slightly too into it. On paper, a great historical war game has every right to be as popular as a game on par with Warhammer, but it's not. People say Warhammer 40k is too popular for its own good, has a rich lore and backstory. It all started back in the 80s as a parody, um, but has many installments of the tabletop game itself, including spin-offs, novels, stories set in the world of 40k. But as you can see, the imagery right here is rather dark, and I'll highlight that again on my next slide. So this is a couple of depictions of one of the, a couple of the factions um, within the, the Imperial Guard in Warhammer 40,000, that being the Death Corp of Krieg, the guy dressed in a rather familiar-looking uniform, and the Commissar over there. Um, again, imagery aside, quite a fascist take, one would say. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, but getting back to bolt action, is it okay if someone has to play the Nazis? Maybe. The response to Guy and Hattie's video was incredibly negative. Many in the community jumped onto arguing Guy and Hattie's stance. Some even further defended, denied the issues that wargaming has a place for Nazis, despite evidence to the contrary. Games Workshop, the creators of the tabletop war game Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000, have issued a statement condemning the presence of Nazi imagery at a Spanish Warhammer 40,000 tournament in the real world. It reflects their commitment to maintaining a safe, inclusive community within the Warhammer hobby. Games Workshop has a strong stance of, against any forms of prejudice, hatred, or abuse. They prioritize creating a welcoming environment for all players, respective of their background or beliefs. Instances of individuals promoting or displaying Nazi imagery would be contrary to their values and policies. The company has likely taken appropriate action to address the incident, which would be reiterating their policies uh, to the tournament organizers, promoting education and awareness of the consequences of such actions, potentially implementing stricter guidelines or codes of conduct for future. In November 2021, Games Workshop released a statement condemning these hate groups and their ideology after an incident at a Warhammer 40,000 tournament in Spain. The tournament, GT Talvera, reported reportedly allowed a participant wearing clothing with Nazi symbols to complete to compete in the tournament, which caused outrage amongst the community. Some opponents refused to play this individual, resulting in forfeits. The organizers of GT Talvera, a Warhammer 40k club called El Cobrador del Wag, uh, Wag being the war cry of the fantasy space orcs, uh, responded to the controversy by condemning the Nazi mentality um, but stated that expelling an individual would require involving the police, which is something they didn't want to do. They explained that displaying the Nazi symbols is not illegal in Spain unless accompanied by criminal conduct, and they feared legal repercussions if they expelled the person for their deplorable ideas. The response from the organizers indicated that they would be providing, working on providing tools and resources for future tournaments to expel members of extremist hate groups from their events. This aligns with the rules already. In place, of, in, in place at official Games Workshop conventions and events where hate speech and symbols on clothing are explicitly prohibited. Uh, da, da, da. It's worth noting that Games Workshop's direct response to community issues is relatively uncommon, as they, they typically refrain from commenting on such matters. The statement addressing hate groups uh, came amidst ongoing boycott campaigns by some players, which raised concerns about employee salaries, pricing, and limited time orders for models. Basically, Games Workshop is still a capitalist country whilst pretending to care. Capitalist company whilst pretending to care. Unfortunately, there's no specific information available about proactive steps Games Workshop may take to prevent similar incidents like the GT Talvera um, tournament. 
in future, but there was no response from the company at the time of the article's publication. All righty. Now I have you. Now I have you sufficiently warmed up. Let's leave the grim darkness of the forty-first millennium and move into the video game space. So, let's. This is where the real war crimes begin. So let's lay. Uh, da, 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 da. Who is really making the video games we play? So who here is familiar with the video games Call of Duty, the Call of Duty franchise? Pretty much everyone in this room has played COD, majority of the people under 30. <laughs> All right. Um, COD is a highly popular video game franchise developed by various studios under Activision Blizzard. It primarily focuses on military-themed first-person shooter games that depicts fictionalized conflicts and combat scenarios. The franchise has released numerous installments, each with its own storyline, setting, and characters. While the Call of Duty series inspires it draws its inspiration from real-world military conflicts, it is important to note that the games are in fact fictional and not intended to be historically accurate representations of specific events or wars. The narratives of these settings are primarily designed for entertainment purposes, aiming to provide players with an immersive and engaging gaming experience. However, it is worth mentioning that the franchise has faced criticism and debate regarding its portrayal of war, as well as its potential where it links to real-life conflict, propaganda, and war profiteering. Some critics even argue that the game may glamorize or sanitize the realities of war, potentially desensitizing its players to the crew conse uh, consequences and complexities of armed conflict. Additionally, there have been discussions about the involvement of military entities in the production of certain Call of Duty games. For example, the US military has cooperated with game developers, in, game developers in creating a realistic military experience, providing resources, technical assistance, and access to military hardware and personnel for the purposes of accurate game representation. These collaborations have raised concerns about potential propaganda or recruitment elements within the game. Furthermore, some critics have accused the video game industry, calling, including, calling, including Call of Duty, of engaging in war profiteering by capitalizing on the fascination with war and violence to generate significant financial gains. These concerns stem from commercial success of the franchise, which has achieved massive sales and profits over the years. There are at least 12 Call of Duty games, I think. Don't quote me on that, but there's quite a lot. Um, it is important to approach the Call of Duty franchise like any form of media with a critical mindset and consider different perspectives regarding the portrayal of war and, and its potential impact and the ethical implications of its content. Ultimately, the interpretation and opinion surrounding these issues may vary among individuals. But let's talk about Brian Batalo. So Brian Batalo is the former executive of Activision Blizzard. Um, uh, he held the chief, a position of Chief Administra Administrative Officer, Officer, CAO, at the company. The role of CAO involves overseeing various administrative functions within the organization. Um, but Brian Batalo has a background in military and defense contracting. Before joining Activision Blizzard, he served as an executive in a, at a private military contractor, Blackwater Worldwide, now known as um, Academy. He held, also held various positions within the U.S. Department of State, including Chief of Staff. Why is this man making video games? Brian Batalo is an American businessman and former executive who's held positions in both the private sector and the U.S. government. He's known for his association with the private military contractor. Blackwater Worldwide was a private military company founded in 1997 by Eric Prince. It has since gained significant attention and controversy for its involvement in security operations during the Iraq War. Blackwater provided services such as per personal security details, uh, training, and logistics support to clients, including the U.S. government. Brian Batalo worked at Blackwater Worldwide and served as an executive at the company. The specific details of his roles and responsibilities during his tenure at Blackwater are not widely known. However, it is known that Blackwater has faced scrutiny and criticism for its actions in Iraq, including the controversial Nisar Square incident in 2007, in which Blackwater personnel were involved in the shooting of an innocent that resulted in civilian casualties. After his time at Blackwater, Patalo transitioned to a career in the public sector, joined the US Department of State, and held several positions, including Chief of Staff to the Sir to Secretary Mike Pompeo. 
but Talu played a key role in managing the State Department's operations and advising the, Se the Secretary of State on various matters. Secondly, um, we're going to talk about Fran Townsend. So Fran Townsend is another Activision CEO with ties to the military. So Townsend begun, um, is a lawyer, began her prosecutional career in 1985, serving as a direct, um, assistant, di uh, assistant direct attorney in Brooklyn. Uh, she gained support and mentorship from federal um, federal prosecutors, like from, for example, Rudy Giuliani. Um, but, but, but Townsend moved to the Justice Department in early 1990s to work on international legal matters, and she worked for the Office of the Attorney General to assist in creating new Office of International Programs, predecessor to, during the Clinton administration, served in various positions in the Justice Department. So when she joined Activism, Activision Blizzard, um, she was excuse, um, Executive Vice President for Corporate Affairs, Corporate Security, and Chief Compliance Officer to oversee government affairs and policy and communications. While serving as an Executive Vice President of Activision Blizzard, an open letter signed by over 2,000 employees called for Townsend to stand by her word and step down as Executive Sponsor of ABK Employee Women's Networks due to her criticized response to a California Department a fair employment, housing, and lawsuit. It later revealed that Activision prison Blizzard Bobby Kotick had written the latter CEO and not Townsend. But she's also worked for the U.S. President's Intelligence Advisory Board, um, which oversees um, all of the in military security for the USA. Um, that's right, is it? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. So, and acted as Homeland Security Advisor for the US under George W. Bush. Again, why are, why are these people now making video games? Seems kind of bizarre. Um, but Call of Duty is but one example, uh, and this is not isolated an, an isolated incident. My favorite video game at the moment, well, apart from No Man's Sky, which Sarah will know, um, is um, a game called a game called um, Ace Combat 7, Skies Unknown, uh, in which we fly around in warplanes. This is an actual, well, it's half a screenshot because I couldn't get the whole thing, screenshot from the very intro launch to the video game, which shows all of the manufacturers of all of the weapon systems used by the US military and all of their various copyrights. And this is a splash screen, which, launches, which fires up as soon as you launch the game up, which is quite interesting. Uh, and people argue that this is done for the sake of accuracy and things like that. And they're like, wow, look how realistic. Um, but games, uh, other games in a similar kind of genre, such as War Thunder, have actually had military documents leaked upon them. Um, because people want to be so accurate that, for example, the plans for Leave, one of the, the, new, the newest F fighter, got re released on War Thunder forums, which is pretty funny. Um, and people got in trouble for that. Um, secondly, the story of Ace Combat 7 centers around how drone strikes conducted by, by rogue nations are acts of terrorism, and only the Ocean Federation, Ace Combat's analog of America, have the only pilots capable to stop them. And even, pi even, even pilots sent to penal colonies can end up redeeming themselves to become heroes. That's a pretty messed up story, if you ask me. So moving on to the development of um, actual shooters, which is kind of the bread and butter video game that will get people hooked and hopefully recruited by the US military. Um, so the development of military shooters, uh, games designed specifically to train soldiers, has a long history intertwined with advancements in technology and the military's desire to enhance training methodologies. These games aim to provide realistic environments that can simulate combat scenarios and help soldiers develop skills and tactics. One of the earliest examples of military, of military training games can be traced back to the 1980s with the introduction of flight simulators. These simulators allowed pilots to practice flying maneuvers and combat scenarios in safe and controlled environments. Over time, technology advanced and game developers started creating more and more complex and realistic training games for the various military branches. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, the popularity of first-person shooters, FPS, like the Delta Force and America's Army series grew within the military community. These games would provide 
were designed to provide training value whilst also serving as handy recruitment tools. So in the case of America's Army, um, if you told your military recruiter at basic training that you had played AA, you would get bonus points because you know all the buzzwords and all of the um, chain of command doctrine and all of that kind of stuff through playing America's Army. You know exactly how how to lay out the kit and lay out the medic bag and things like that, which, again, pretty messed up, but effective. Um, so they, they aim to familiarize players with military tactics, weapons, and equipment, and battle doctrine, and in some cases even offered online multiplayer components where players could collaborate in simulated missions. The, uh, the development of military strategy games has also played a role in training soldiers um, with games like Clo the Close Combat and Armour series, as well as the Steel Beasts Tank Simulator, offer realistic tactical scenarios that can aid in teaching and decision-making, coordination, and strategic thinking. These games often simulate combat uh, situations, including scenarios based on historical or hypothetical scenarios. Armour 3 and America's Army are often praised at how accurate it is to the current combat systems and tactics used by the modern U.S. Army. America's Army, as I previously mentioned, um, was developed by the United States military and published by the U.S. Department of Defense. The games are designed to provide a virtual experience of military training and operations, whilst again serving as a recruitment tool. It's also important to note that while these military training games can provide benefits, they're not meant to replace real drill training and experience. They serve as supplemental traditional, uh, to traditional training methods and can help soldiers develop critical thinking and teamwork skills in a controlled and immersive environment. But therein lies the danger. Perhaps, if these games are making war sound fun and cool, whilst conditioning the players into learning the systems and having stories propagandized into a pro-war message, are games now more su making people more susceptible to enlisting? Uh, the military's use of these games has evolved over time, and today, virtual reality, or VR, or augmented reality, AR, technology has also been in incorporated into training programs. These technologies offer an even more immersive and realistic experiences, allowing soldiers to, to practice skills in a highly detailed, interactive virtual environments. Overall, the development of military shooters and military strategy games designed to train soldiers has been driven by the goal of enhancing training effectiveness and providing a safe, cost-effective way to simulate combat scenarios. So you can kind of see why the interest, why the the U.S. military has a vested interest in the development of video games and getting people hooked on them. More meat for that grinder. Uh, the U.S. military has at times funded the development of certain video games. The main purpose of funding is often to enhance recruitment and improve public relations, as well as increase the military's presence in within the gaming industry by collaborating with game developers or providing financial support. The military aims to create games that show that showcase the armed forces in a positive light or portray military operations and equipment with a level of accuracy. These collaborations have been subject of debate and controversy. Critics argue that the, such partnerships uh, may blur the lines between entertainment and propaganda, potentially influ uh, influencing young players' perceptions of the military and war. On the other hand, Proponents um, assert that these games can offer an educational value and insight into the military life and history. But what does this mean through a Marxist lens? All right. So if we apply Marxist thinking to this, I, I yeah, I know it's a sniper rifle. It's funny. Uh, it's kind of funny. Um, so commodity fetishism. Marxist analysis highlights the, the tendency of capitalism to commodify various aspects of our life. Military shooters and strategy games, including those designed for training soldiers, are commodities produced and consumed by the capitalist system. They, create, they are created to generate profits for game developers and publishers, often catering to the demand for the entertainment and escapism. They fund the military industrial complex, as has been shown. Um, focuses on the relationship between capitalism and the military industrial complex. The development of military games, especially those with collaborations within the military, can be seen as a manifestation of the deep entanglement between the military and the capitalist interests, such as collaborations 
Such collaborations can only serve as a means of predominating militarism, supporting the arms industry, and indirectly contributing to war profiteering. Marxist theory also emphasizes the role of ideology in maintaining the status quo and re re reinforcing dominant power structures. Military strudas and strategy games can be seen as tools of ideological conditioning, presenting a particular worldview that often glorifies warfare and reinforces national sentiments and promotes a heroic narrative of military engagement. They can also contribute to the construction of a militaristic culture influencing perceptions of attitudes and players. Alienation and simulation. Marxist analysis also touches upon the concept of alienation where workers become disconnected from the products of their labor and broader social con um, context. In the context of military games, this alienation can be observed as players engaged in simulated um, combat experiences that may detach them from real world consequences and human suffering associated with armed conflicts as well as documented evidence of the artists who make video games not being paid fairly or mistreated um, due to crunch workloads and deadlines in game development, especially those associated with the likes of Activision Blizzard and the AAA gaming industry. The emphasis on virtual warfare can also desensitize individuals to the, realistic, to the realities of violence and war. From a socialist perspective, the development and consumption of military games can be seen as reflective of broader class dynamics. While soldiers, who often come from working class backgrounds, may benefit from training tools that enhance their skills, the profit-driven nature of the industry places the control and ownership of these games in the hands of the capitalist elite. This perpetuates power imbalances and reinforces the, reinforces the um, exploitation of labor for capitalist gain. I'm going to hand over to Caden now for something a little bit more positive. Uh, what positives do we have? Um, what games can we play which avoid these war profiteering and capitalistic pitfalls? Well, I just wanted to uh, conclude with by saying that we're not saying that if you enjoy these games that you're bad or whatever. Like, it's at the end of the day, it is entertainment and it's all good and fine. We're just like trying to bring some like, attention to the fact that um, a lot of the time the people who create these games have some have some um, agenda in mind <clears throat> and a lot of the time it is indeed like quite uh, there are happens. no consequences to it there no, are yeah. yeah yeah there's no consequences to it um, that it's just like a coincidence when actually half the time it is very much design um, by design by design um, with that said, though, it isn't all doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. um, the indie indie game developers are very much a thing, and they are getting better and better at making games um, with a lot of very interesting things to say. Um, this one game developer that I, I quite enjoy is uh, Silver Spook Games, which is a one-man crew creating games with anti-imperialism and decolonization themes. Um, Christian Miller is a mixed race indigenous Hawaiian man, um, and his games draw on his own experiences working as a social worker in US occupied Hawaii. His most well known work is Neo Feud, a point and click visual novel set in a cyberpunk dystopia where you play as a grizzled social worker and ex cop known as Carl Carbon, who is tasked with helping disadvantaged youths before. He stumbles upon a deeper plot threatening those at the bottom. Um, there is also the the gaming company uh, Motion Twin, which is a studio run as an anarcho syndicalist workers cooperative with a team of eight to ten people, um, where they all have equal salaries and equal decision making power. Um, they are most well known for the game Dead Cells, a rogue-like Metroidvania with some Souls-like elements. It is a 2D platformer. We traverse an ever-changing castle. I wanted to talk about Motion Twin for the interesting working structure of the studio, and which goes to show that you do not need corrupt executives and boards of directors to create amazing games to critical acclaim. 
and um, and success. Motion Twin is only one of many such studios working in this way. Um, there's also um, Disco Elysium. <laughs> um, this game is currently in a sort of strange situation um, with with uh, the way it's being handled by um, developers and the studio itself. Um, we 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 don't can endorse piracy, but we do recommend that you uh, yeah acquire it by other means. I can't I can't I'm personally not very comfortable recommending buying the game, no. and I can't really say that you can you should pirate it, but it's it's. Nobody is getting hurt. <laughs> <laughs> um, Disco Elysium is a role-playing game with an is isometric style, following the story of uh, political struggle and murder at the seaside city of Elysium. You play as disgraced, um, drug-induced amnesiac detective Harrier Dubois, um, tasked with solving a murder with ties to a unionization effort in the city. Um, which has a rich history of political struggle, including several communist revolutions over several decades ago. Um, the game is story rich and pushed by dialogue options and skill checks rather than by combat. And it is not for the faint of heart. I highly suggest that if you want to play this game, look up content warnings in advance. Yeah, make sure you have the spoons to play it before playing yeah. it. It will knock you for six. Yeah, it doesn't pull its punches. Um, other honorable mentions would be like The Outer Worlds, which is a, another role-playing game that's more sort of first-person shootery, third-person shootery kind. Uh, the same made by the same developers who worked on Fallout New Vegas. Um, I also suggest looking at people like uh, James Stephanie Sterling and their review series, uh, The Jim Quisition, which talks a lot about the gaming industry with its news and shedding light on the many abuses going on that are often covered up. Um, also, uh, Conquest of Dread, also known as Cool Timothy, is a tattooist from our own Auckland, makes video essays about his own experience, own experiences as a mixed man of uh, Napui and Nataiwai and Pākehā descent, and in nerdy subcultures. His video on decolonizing games is an excellent piece to of follow-up material to this talk. And Absolutely. Gwen has a little bit more on... I have a little bit on um, tabletop games. Not so much war games, unfortunately, um, but tabletop games that kind of demystify and uh, a little bit decolonial and not focused on war profiteering. Um, for example, uh, I do like the, kind of the idea of misspent youth, where you play as young rebels trying to topple the system. You can topple, you can tackle those those heavy topics, but it's one of those games where you're 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 just playing as punks, basically. You are young people living in an oppressive state. And you are the goals of a particular play session would be we're gonna go and tag a police station or something <laughs> like that. And it's everything that leads up to tagging that police station. Another one that is really, really cool um, is Tales from the Loop, which is set in a, it's kind of like a peaceful 1980s style sci-fi. 1980s style sci-fi akin to Stranger Things, where you play as kids on bikes and you're going around and exploring and none of the adults believe you that there are scary things happening. Um, and if you like that kind of thing, that's really, really cool too. Um, and finally, uh, Comrades, which I've only just found today, which is great. So Comrades is a tabletop RPG about life in the level revolutionary underground. Based on the apocalyptic world engine, it pits players against a corrupt government, forcing them to fight from the shadows uh, to free the people from their chains. Playing as characters like the soldier, the student, the propagandist, and the worker, your comrades will mount rallies, stage coups, evade secret police, and fight fascist goons. A campaign of comrades takes place in any settings players dream up, modern or historical, real or imagined, give them a chance to create revolution of their own. That sounds really fun, and I just bought the rule book. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's all we have, really. That's all we have. Oh, um, yes, also, um, if you're wanting some kind of leftist critique of games, games media, both tabletop and video, I can highly recommend Snipe and Web's Misanthropod. Um, really, really awesome. Um, and it's just three people that talk about their experiences gaming and how that relates to them living their lives. Awesome. Cool. Thank That's you. everything. <laughs>